All right, everybody, it's Wednesday. Welcome back to another uh, Whiskey Wednesday with me, Mary. I'm coming to you from D.C. Mo, you're home now, right? Mo's back, yeah. in, back in San Francisco. Very exciting. And then Chris is uh, coming from Dallas. Um, today, we're really excited. This week um, in whiskey business, uh, at the end of this week, is repeal day. So we have a really amazing uh, guest for you today. Um, a family friend of mine and um, an amazing author, um, Mark Will Weber. He's the author of Mint Juleps with Teddy Roosevelt, um, which is a complete guide to presidential drinking. If you've never seen it, really, really fun. Um, and then also uh, a book called A Musket to an Applejack, which is really about Civil War drinking guild and Applejack, which is a very American um, spirit. Um, oh, look at that. The mom's got it too. Um, so I would like to welcome to the program uh, Mark Will Weber. Here he comes. Hey, everybody. I'm uh, pleased to be invited to uh, Whiskey Wednesday. Uh, We're, happy nobody, so. <laughs> We're happy uh, to have you. I suffered um, through something. <laughs> I want to tell people a little bit about yourself and uh, what brings you to this, to this path of writing, of spirits writing. Well, it was, uh, it was an inadvertent uh, stumbling, actually, because I used to work for Runner's World and I wrote uh, books about long distance running and marathons and the Olympics and stuff like that. But I, I kind of got sick of writing about running and I thought, I, you know, I really like history and you know, I'm going to try to write some history books. And uh, a friend of mine read somewhere about uh, one of the presidents drinking, I forget which one. And he said, I was, you know, I was fascinated by that. He said, you know, I, I wanted to know what all those guys drank. And he said, you're a writer. Why don't you write this book about uh, what all the presidents drink? And I'm like, Pat, what, what am I going to write about, you know, guys like Calvin Coolidge who didn't drink? You know, I, I won't know what the, they won't, I won't be able to put a chapter together or Hayes, you know, somebody like that who didn't have alcohol in the White House. And and he kept bugging me about it. A year went by and finally just to shut him up, I said, look, I'm gonna do the four guys that I know didn't drink much. And if they're interesting, I'll keep going. And, uh, and actually the, the guys that were light drinkers were very interesting because everybody around them drinks and makes them miserable. Like Lincoln hardly drank at all, but you know, all his generals drank and all his uh, uh, staff drank. And so he was constantly trying to deal with that. So that's, I sort of got into it uh, backwards in that way. And, uh, and then thankfully, uh, the book turned out to be fairly successful. And uh, my publisher is actually in DC, Regnery uh, Publishing. They're, they're very, very conservative, which I didn't know when I agreed to go with them. But uh, it worked out. They didn't throw me off the building for voting for Obama twice. <laughs> I love that. Um, so. Well, as you're writing this, I guess um, right now, uh, looking at the president's president we just had and the president we're about to have, we're we're living in a little bit of a teetotaling era here in D.C. Um, between between Trump and Biden coming on. Um, but what were some of the presidents who really used the residence as like a social, a convivial place um, that kind of brought that spirit and revelry into the White House with them? Well, the first guy that, that comes to mind. Uh was, uh, yeah, listen to me, like Warren, Hart, Warren G. Harding, who is, uh, you know, in the 1920s. And he's often, um, he's, he's often held up as one of the worst presidents. If you see a list of the worst presidents, Harding is always near the bottom with Buchanan and, and uh, a couple other people and soon to be joined by someone else, I think. Uh, but that last bottom five, you'll always find Harding's name in there because uh, he was very hypocritical. He, he actually was elected uh, by courting the dry vote because it was during prohibition. And so he, he was from uh, Ohio, from the Midwest, and he, he made it seem like he was you know, against alcohol, but he drank all the time in the White House. He had poker games there and you could get anything that you wanted. His favorite trick was to go golfing uh, again uh, a correlation with some recent presidents. And uh, he would stuff a fifth of whiskey in his golf bag and he'd drink a shot before he teed off. And then, uh, you know, a couple of holes later, he would drink another shot. And he almost never broke a hundred because by the time he got to the back nine, he was 
he was a little wavery. So yeah, so uh, Harding was uh, a big uh, party guy in the White House at a time where nobody was supposed to drink, you know, which I, I found fascinating. And there's some great stories where he actually uh, lost. A, a whole set of White House china to a woman. He cut a deck of cards and said, hey, if, if, if you can outdraw me on this, this cold cut of the cards, I'll give you that set of china, which he, and he did. Next day, it was on her doorstep at her, uh, at her townhouse in Georgetown. So he was a weird dude. And his, his wife, uh, they called her the Duchess, and she would scurry about and refresh the drinks of all his cronies during these poker games, uh, Florence Harding. And they would even yell at her, hey, Duchess, get over here. My drink's uh, gone, you know, refresh this drink. Can you imagine one of the modern uh, first ladies scurrying about to uh, fill up the glasses of the cronies? Well, they, I think that's interesting because, um, and I'm gonna throw this to Chris in just, just a second, but um, Harding was, was the president at the heart, uh, heart of prohibition, really. I mean, that, that was, he was for all of that. And, and I've heard even, um, I read in your book um, that they even called the, the the second floor of the White House was like a speakeasy during Prohibition. Pretty much. I'm getting lagged. I'm getting lagged. Sorry. Am I? No, he's, he said pretty much. I think. Chris, if you want to go ahead and ask a question. Oh, he did. Okay, I couldn't. I, everything kind of lagged on me. Sorry. <laughs> no worries. Lag, uh, lag, yeah. Lag. Well, so yeah, coming up on repeal day, I actually wanted to know um, how do you think like the the how Harding was and how the people were actually drinking. How do you think this kind of hampered or kind of thrust whiskey and you know spirits back to the forefront? And you know what I'm saying, like. Because no, everybody knew everybody else was drinking. So, I think there was a lot of factors, uh, actually. But as you as you point out, everybody was drinking behind the scenes anyway, and the only people that were making money from it were the organized crime, and of course the rich people drank all the time. So it it really was almost impossible to enforce. Uh, I mean, they, they would bust people once in a while, you know. Uh, one of the things that sort of kicked it over too was during, uh, it was either at the very end of uh, Harding's uh, time or maybe even the Hoover's, but somewhere during the end of Prohibition there, the uh, St. Valentine's Day Massacre occurred in Chicago, you know, which was famous and that was all about alcohol. So there sort of came this point where it was like, wow, you know, the only people that are making money off this are the hoods, everybody's drinking anyway. And then of course, Roosevelt, as we came in and coming out of uh, the bad depression, the depression had a lot to do with it because the government needed the revenue desperately because everybody was out of work. So there was no taxes, you know, from the bulk of the people. And, uh, and they thought, geez, you know, everybody's making money under the table with alcohol. It's time for the government to get back in the act and make money from alcohol. And I think, honestly, that was probably the biggest, uh, biggest drive behind uh, going wet again. And uh, thank God for that. So I wanted to ask, um, you've, you've had a chance to do a lot of research on what they were drinking. Are there any cocktails that have kind of like passed on through presidency, like mint juleps or anything else that were like favorites of presidents beforehand? Yeah, and that's a great question. Uh, really, you know, you, you had very crude cocktails even early in the revolution days. In fact, pre-revolution, you had this thing called Flip. They were drinking the colonial fathers up in New England. And Flip basically was kind of a, a rum milkshake with, with uh, an egg in it and some nutmeg and stuff like that. So it was not that different than eggnog, except it was all rum. So you had that and then mint juleps you start seeing around the turn of the of the, uh, the late 1700s, early 1800s, you start seeing mint juleps. Uh, so they were very elementary crude cocktails coming in, nothing super fancy. 
Uh, as far as what the presidents drank that carried on, you know, they, they used to do this thing where they, when you were running for president, a lot of times they would name a cocktail after the candidate. So one of my favorites is something called the McKinley's Delight, which was uh, William McKinley, uh, some bartender in St. Louis came up that, for uh, that drink at the Republican convention in uh, 1896. And it's got a little absence in it and I forget what else, but it's a tasty drink and it's, it's formidable. I wouldn't drink, you know, I, I like having one and if you're gonna have two call Uber, you know, it's, it's pretty spicy. <laughs> Uh, that drink, but the McKinley's Delight has got a great history behind it because uh, in, uh, I think it was 1898 when the Maine got sunk uh, uh, in Havana Harbor, they changed the name of the drink to remember the name, but it was, it was actually still the McKinley's Delight just under a different name. So, you know, you had drinks like that named after the presidents. Uh, Teddy Roosevelt, and you know, I named that uh, the, my first book, uh, on this subject, uh, mint juleps with Teddy Roosevelt, because yeah, Teddy used to serve um, uh, mint juleps courtside at the tennis court, and they had a a uh, bed of fresh mint um, right next to the tennis court, so they would use the mint from that. Now, Teddy, being a New Yorker, for some reason preferred rye whiskey. He wasn't a big drinker, by the way. He used these mint juleps to entice his cabinet to play tennis with him because they wouldn't want to play. Roosevelt got so into it that even if it rained or was a crummy day, he'd want to play tennis. And his cabinet was like, Teddy wants to play tennis again. What, what's going on? So to entice them to play after three sets or so, he'd have his uh, guy uh, Pinckney bring up out the mint juleps. And uh, then Teddy would deliver them to the players with a toothy grin. And he'd say, and they'd say, thank you, Mr. President. And he'd say, delighted. And they actually became known as the tennis cabinet because uh, he had them over there playing tennis all the time. But I maintain that without these mint juleps, uh, you know, there would have been less enthusiasm for it. I feel like, I feel like that's our new code at, at, at like Tales of the Cocktail when we're down there and you know, everybody's really imbibing. We're gonna act as a ambassador team, like we're going to play tennis and we're gonna be like tennis cabinets and you know, look real official, yes. but. There you go. <laughs> I was um, at one tail of the cocktails and I could I can't imagine even holding a racket you know, <laughs> after a night. We try to stay above the water in the pool, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I need a flotation device. We um so we just coming off a, a, an election and I think I one of the I was reading something really interesting about um about really how candidates use booze to apply voters for votes. Um, and we don't see that so much now or not as explicitly, but I mean, there were some pretty major parties that were all meant to just liquor people up and get their vote, um, like day of elections or in inaugurations as a celebration after. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the most, uh, I mean, people used to ask me all the time, was alcohol always a part of the uh, United States uh, process and I said it predates the, that process because we know for a fact that that Washington when he ran for the House of Burgesses in Virginia so this is when everybody are still British citizens by the way so there is there's no revolution on the horizon yet and Bur and he runs young Washington runs for the House of Burgesses and we, we actually have the the menu of all the drinks that he served to his constituents. And it was an enormous amount of, and quite a variety, you know, Madeira and rum and maybe even some whiskey, but certainly wine and beer. And it was quite a bit of alcohol. And of course he got elected, but that was sort of understood back then that if you were running for political office, you stood for drinks, you know, in the village square or whatever. So it predates uh, even the presidential process uh, but one of the most interesting ones is William Henry Harrison and the log cabin uh, hard cider campaign where uh, it actually was a uh, reaction to a slur where they, you know, they tried to make Harrison out to be a country bumpkin. And they said, look, if you give him a jug of hard cider and a log cabin, he'll retire happily. And uh, they turned it around and made it like their, their uh, cornerstone of their campaign. So, uh, his guys at like voting places would 
resurrect these little baked log cabins and drink the whole time in there, not just hard cider and Applejack and whiskey and stuff. And they would, and they would harass the other guys, uh, uh, would-be voters, I think Van Buren. And, and they tried to paint Van Buren into being this uh, champagne aristocrat. So you had, you had this whole uh, class thing going where, uh, you know, Harrison's guys tried to pose as the common man and anybody that voted for Van Buren was an elite, you know. And it's very interesting, if, again, if you view that through recent times, you can see those, uh, that alcohol plays a role in those divisions as well. So alcohol's already, always been there. And even, you know, we, we tend to think it's not there in these modern campaigns, but it actually is, but just in a weird guise. In other words, you go to this $500 a plate dinner in support of a modern day candidate, and they're gonna have the best California wines there, that kind of thing. Obama certainly did that. Um, you know, he'd hold a dinner in, at, at an exclusive restaurant in Harlem, and he would bring in these really top shelf wines from California for his constituents that, uh, or his supporters that were gonna give him a grand or five grand or 10 grand, you know. So uh, it still happens, but it's sort of uh, in, in concert with these elaborate dinners. That's cool. And you mentioned Marty Van Buren. He was actually, he was painted as, as, as an elitist, um, but he was actually born in a bar, right? Like he was yeah. down to, I read that. Yeah. <laughs> born in a bar, yeah. You know, and uh, I mean, Van Buren's really interesting because I do occasionally get asked, you know, who were the best drinkers? And, you know, people often go, well, Grant must have been a great drinker. You know, he's a big drinker, right? And I said, Grant was a bad drinker. He couldn't hold his alcohol. He had one drink and he was already red in the face. And but Van Buren was a great drinker and he was a tiny guy. He was only like five foot six or something, five, five. And uh, the only president smaller than Van Buren is uh, Madison. And uh, Van Buren could drink, uh, I would say he and Buchanan. Buchanan's the only president from Pennsylvania. He's also a terrible president, but a great drinker. And those guys are probably the two best at, at putting it down and, and holding it, not, not being totaled. And Van Buren is so interesting because, uh, you know, his first language was Dutch. He was born in sort of that, that part of New York where they, a lot of the uh, Dutch settled. And when I researched them, I kept finding references that Van Buren liked to drink Scheidem. And I'm thinking, what is Scheidem? I don't know what that is. And here it, it turned out that there was this city in the Netherlands in Holland that made so much gin that they would sometimes just interchange the name of that city with gin. It was a, it was a type of Dutch gin is what it was, but uh, Scheidem made so much of it, it produced so much of it that they would sometimes call it either gin or, or Scheidem or the Dutch name for, uh, for gin, which I think is uh, Genevieve or Javier or something, I can't even say. Genevieve, but, yeah. <laughs> So yeah, it's a little little Van Buren actually was a great drinker and uh, could hold his own. And as I said, Buchanan was a huge drinker and very fond of whiskey, by the way. Rye, he could punish a, a keg of rye. Uh, and, and, and Buchanan also owned a tavern in Lancaster uh, prior, prior to uh, uh, becoming a full-fledged politician. That's pretty wild. Um, so... You kind of touched on uh, Washington, but we all know he made his own whiskey. Who else made their whiskey and kind of got dabbled in those uh, types of arts? Yeah, you know, Washington made his own whiskey and, and the Mount Vernon people have recently recreated that still, by the way. It's, it's very close to the main house that we're all familiar with. And I haven't been there, but um, They've recreated it and they're selling the, the, the whiskey and I, I'm told it's pretty harsh stuff, but and they're selling it at an exorbitant price, like $90 a bottle or something silly. And it's not very good from what I understand. But, uh, you know, one time Washington had five stills cranking out whiskey and uh, they were selling it off the backs of wagons in Old Town, Alexandria. And it was one of the most profitable things on his plantation. And he had a he had a Scottish overseer uh, that knew how to make it, and we know this from his letters that that uh, you know he would write a friend and he he'd say, well, 
you know, my overseer says I can find my account in this. And by that he meant make money. And, uh, and he made lots of money from whiskey. And it was only a couple of years after he had put out the Whiskey Rebellion, uh, all those guys out in Western Pennsylvania that didn't want to pay taxes. So he put down the competition and went into the business himself, presumably he paid taxes on his sales. And the other guy that, that had whiskey on his own premises or is Andrew Jackson out at uh, his place near Nashville. He had whiskey uh, made there. And it's really cool because when you go into some of his old letters, you can tell that he was using this whiskey as sort of a currency. So a guy made him like a handmade uh, pair of dueling pistols and he, he writes him a letter. The guy's name was Captain something or other. Captain, I forget his last name. Uh, and he says, hey, thanks for those dueling pistols. They're exquisite, blah, blah, blah. Please feel free to stop by the still at any time and help, help yourself to as much whiskey as you may need or require. So uh, I thought that was cool, you know, that they, they would just kind of use it as an alternate currency. And I think that went on a lot, you know, where um, even in Washington's uh, situation, people would bring in the grain and he processed the grain at his mill for a percentage of it. Uh, so maybe they'd get 80% and the, as payment, they would use the, give him the 20% and he'd make it into whiskey or whatever. So there was a lot of bartering going on with whiskey. It was almost like a second currency, especially in some of these frontier areas. So and in your estimation, which president had like that good balance of like the drinking, the politics and kind of like keeping everything together? Was there one that kind of stood out to you through time that kind of like it's seemed like they question. kind of got it right? That's a really good question. and. Uh, you know, we've already said that Harding is out for that, and uh, certainly Buchanan is out, and Nixon was a terrible drinker. He couldn't hold his booze at all. He, you know, he would drunk dial, so Nixon is out. But the guy that I would say that fits your description the best is probably Harry Truman. And Truman, I, people ask me this all the time, they like, if you could have a drink with any one of the presidents, who would it be? And it, and this is strictly from the drinking standpoint, uh, Truman is very interesting because for one thing, he has no qualms of having a shot of bourbon in the morning. And what he would do is he would get up and he'd do like a two mile walk and then he'd roll down and then he'd do a two or three ounce shot of bourbon. And when I read that, I was like, wow, this dude is drinking before breakfast. But I think it was sort of more of a medicinal thing. You know, somebody back in, in Missouri probably told him, listen, Harry, if you have a shot of bourbon uh, every morning, you won't get a cold or something. So he did that. It was part of his regular routine, which I thought was cool. He also would, would drink uh, when he played cards, uh, which a lot of the presidents did, by the way, Roosevelt, uh, FDR, I mean, uh, would drink while he played cards. And uh, Harry loved bourbon. And one of my favorite stories was uh, back in that time when the presidents would often have the journalists on the same train car with them. The, the journalists would have their own car. And uh, if Truman was going to make a speech, the journalists, you know, a dozen or two of them would be along in their own car. And Truman got along with the press fairly well. It's not that he didn't occasionally have a tiff, but they liked him and he liked them. And he would sometimes, if he had time on one of these train trips, he'd sit down and play cards with them. And one day he was walking through and they were playing poker, the journalists, and they say, hey, Mr. President, you want to sit down and have a drink and play a few hands? And he said, oh, man, I, I'd, I'd love to, but I don't have time for the play. But, you know, I'll have a drink. And they say, hey, do you want a scotch? And Truman said, no, I don't want a scotch. And they're there, oh, okay. Well, and then somebody had bourbon. He goes, oh, yeah, I'd love a bourbon. So he had a bourbon. And then somebody said, what, you don't like scotch, Mr. President? And he shook his head and he said, every time you drink a scotch, you put another quarter in Joe Kennedy's pocket. And he hated Joe Kennedy, who was FD, uh, was JFK's dad, and his despicable person, by the way, if you read anything about uh, Joe Kennedy. And Joe Kennedy had cornered the British scotch market coming out of the of the uh, prohibition 
and the, the gin. So he made tons of money from scotch and, and British gins. And so Truman refused to drink scotch because he hated Joe Kennedy. And uh, so that's a great Truman story. Uh, another one, quickly I'll tell, um, the Supreme Court justices ruled against Truman on this, this strike that, that Truman wanted uh, settled on his behalf. And they knew he was angry about it. So the Hugo Black, who was one of the justices, invited Truman to a barbecue to try to uh, smooth over his ruffled feathers and ego. And Truman got there and he was still kind of brooding about it. And, and they had whiskey there and they gave him a bourbon and Truman still hadn't said much and he was sipping his bourbon. And uh, finally he said, Hugo, I don't care much for your laws, but damn, this bourbon sure is good. And uh, so he, he sort of came around after they, they gave him enough good bourbon at this barbecue. So Tr Truman was, uh, yeah, I mean, he was very uh, human about his, his drinking and he had a good sense of humor about it. And yet you don't read too much about him, you know, being over the top and not being able to perform his duties or anything silly like that. So I'd say Harry. Sweet. Um, so um, I noticed in, in, a, in a lot of things that um, throughout American history, up until a point, um, the, the armies really provided booze on the field um, during during different um, times um, and, and during the Civil War. Uh, what were people drinking on the field during the Civil War? Like, what was um, what what kind of spirit was there? What was their pattern? Was it only to celebrate wins or commiserate losses, or was there a culture of it? Yeah, I mean, as you pointed out. Um, the alcohol was always there. And, and firstly, uh, it, it actually had a reason for being there because it was medicinal in that if you got wounded, especially if you were an officer, if I'm a lieutenant and I'm at Antietam or Gettysburg and I'm going across the field and I get shot and I'm down on the field, the first thing I do is reach into my field jacket and I have a little flask in there. And in that flask, I either have peach brandy or I have whiskey. Uh, but some sort of booze. And I knock that down until somebody gets out there and drags me off the field. And then they give me more when they dig the bullet out. And some of the guys would actually carry little cakes of opium as well. They were sort of like, think of a Rice Krispie treat, a little sticky thing. And they, they would eat that little cake of opium because uh, alcohol, and if you were lucky enough to have these, uh, access to opium, were the only painkillers they had when they started to dig bullets out of you. So there was that, and they also would 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 use uh, alcohol with quinine to to fight off uh, you know various diseases you'd get from mosquitoes and stuff. Because especially in the east and the south, they were often fighting in swampy territory and stuff. So there was a practical purpose for it, and then of course you know, soldiers always want alcohol or or women, and they can't get the latter very often unless you're an officer. So it usually came down to, you know, booze. And when you ask what they would drink, almost anything. And some of the stuff that they made was really vile, you know, just disgusting stuff, but they would drink that if they couldn't get the good stuff. And uh, the, uh, the worst stuff that I researched and found out about was something called uh, pine top whiskey. And basically, it was sort of like, uh, white lightning whiskey with a lot of pine needles that they would boil. They boil the pine needles and then they take the sap left over and they put it in with this white lightning, almost like Everclear, you know, so really strong 150 and up proof and mix it. And it must have tasted like, you know, some cleaning product or less toil or something. And when you read in their diaries, the soldiers' diaries are fascinating. So whenever you hear a reference to pine top whiskey, they almost always say that bile, bile is the word they used to describe it. So they would drink that. Uh, they drink a lot of peach brandy uh, in the Virginia and stuff because they could get peaches. They would get, uh, they would drink a lot of Applejack. And when I say Applejack, this isn't like hard cider. We're talking like a, a, an apple flavored high-end 
uh, moonshine, basically. And sometimes they'd get so, the cavalry guys would get so loaded they couldn't ride. And the guy that was the least inebriated would lead the other guys on their horses. Um, as punishment, the officers that, that curtail this behavior would sometimes uh, tie the, the guys to the back of a cannon case on and make them run the next day to get sober. Imagine that with a hangover, you're, you're running behind this horse and cannon for uh, five miles or something. So there was always this cat and mouse between the uh, enlisted men and the officers who were trying not to get the regular guys to drink, even though the officers were drinking themselves all the time and better stuff, you know, champagne, whatever they could get. And so there was always this cat and mouse game of trying to sneak alcohol into camp. And the soldiers were ingenious. They would pour it down their rifle barrels and then march into camp and then drink it out of the barrel later. Or they would carve out a watermelon or a pumpkin and put it in there, you know? So they were pretty clever at how to sneak it in. Uh, peaches, you know, they, they, they get these canned peaches because they actually had some very primitive canning. And then you'd open it up and there'd be two peaches in there instead of that sweet syrup that you're used to being in the peaches, it'd be whiskey. So, you know, be two peaches in there with four ounces of whiskey and they, you know, knock that back. So they were, they were very ingenious of getting their alcohol. So my question actually is kind of about a little, the old West kind of thing going on. I'm from Texas, you know, Sam Houston, and we had the Alamo and, and, you know, how did alcohol kind of drive these people in that time uh, comparative to say right after the civil war and you have the old, the, you know, like the old vets and, the, and these new cats and all this new kind of culture coming together. Yeah, I didn't quite catch the tail end of what you said there. Sorry. Uh, yeah, so how it, uh, so how everything kind of correlated together and like, you know, Sam Houston, is he like a drinker? Did he kind of, Ooh, he was a huge drinker and yeah, like whiskey and so tall as I'm sure, you know, being from Texas, that's how it was. Um, yeah. but yeah, how, how did, you know, the alcohol and that culture kind of build those times with the presidency that they had? Yeah, I, I, mean, I think a lot of it was part of the whole, you know, independence thing, you know, and uh, the rugged individual guy out there on the frontier, and uh, it just became part of it. Certainly, it became part of the gambling in the saloons and stuff like that. I mean, since you brought up Houston, Houston was this incredibly tall guy, I think, uh, you know, maybe at 6'5", six, 6'6", six, six, but in that time, that would have been like a giant and, you know, he lived with the Cherokee Indians for a while and his, his Indian name translated to big drunk. <laughs> so he liked to drink a lot. And uh, I think near the end of his life, though, he had quit it completely because uh, like, like uh, General Grant, he didn't have a talent for it. Uh, and I think came to the conclusion that he didn't and, uh, and stopped. But at one point, I think when he was a... Uh, congressman or a senator in uh in washington he actually got into like some duels and stuff when he was drunk and caned a guy in the street or something i i remember reading about it uh don't quote me for certain but it's worth uh checking out but he was an incredible drinker in his heyday and then i think said no mas at some point so i wanted to say you know i mean i Appreciate you saying that, you know, people being 6'5 and 6'6 six, six back in those days with giants because I'm 6'5 myself, you know, so I it's, it's good to know that back then they had called me big something. I don't know what. Um, but I want to ask you, you, you kind of touched on the yeah. dueling aspect of things. Are there any presidents that were kind of good with a pistol and that were known to maybe, you know, knock a few back before they went out there and shot something? I think, I think what actually happened a lot was some of these duels were precipitated by arguments that probably were fueled by alcohol. That certainly was the case with Andrew Jackson who fought several duels. And uh, the, the most, I mean, Jackson 
by the time he's president is actually fairly feeble. He's got bullets in his body from some of these duels that he's fought. And uh, he did kill another guy in a duel. And their argument started as uh, something over a horse race in Kentucky. Jackson had a horse, this other guy had a horse. And then the guy insulted his wife and Jackson, you know, again, they were probably knocking a few back at this horse race. And the day being what it was, his honor was insulted. So he challenged the guy to a duel. The other guy was an expert duelsman and everybody thought he would kill Jackson. Jackson was pretty thin and slender and slight and he wore this big frock coat and he got shot through the coat and it just winged him, he was wounded. And the, the other guy thought he had missed him and was astounded that he had missed. He had actually nicked him. And then Jackson shot the other guy dead. He got the second shot and uh, killed him. And it happened a lot in the military too. These guys, you know, you're out at some frontier post and there's nothing to do but drink when you're not chasing around the, uh, the Native uh, Americans. And they would get into card games and arguments and then one thing would lead to another. You would insult some guy and then, and the, the, the uh, higher ups in the US Army eventually became very uh, dismayed about this dueling stuff because they were losing some really great officers. The most famous being uh, Stephen Decatur who uh, had been the hero of the uh, Barbary pirate thing uh, during Jefferson's presidency. And he got in an argument with another officer and died in a duel. And, and people were like, we can't lose guys like De Stephen Decatur to this stupid dueling thing. So by the end of the civil war, that sort of has died off and there's laws against it and that kind of thing. And of course, we, we all know the story about Hamilton and Burr, you know, which uh, uh, at least resulted in, in, in a long running play. Uh, but uh, so the dueling thing was big back then. And I maintain that a lot of it was fueled by alcohol. So we've seen um, presidents and what, what they drink here. Um, you know, they're drinking native spirit um, with a peach brandy and things like that. But as presidents have ambassadorships and they have foreign relations and they're traveling, have you seen um, elements of them either having experiences with um, other cultures' um, spirits um, while they're there that are surprising to them or uh, trying things that and this is maybe the first time that you know Americans really would have heard of that spirit is that the president was out there trying it or brought it back in some way. Absolutely, yeah, that's a good question too, Mary. It's, um, there's some things that arise uh, Buchanan, before he was president, was the ambassador to Russia. And uh, it was during Jackson's presidency. And somebody even said to Andrew Jackson, I thought you didn't like Buchanan. Why, why would you name him ambassador to Russia? And he said, because there was no place further. <laughs> and uh, so Buchanan was in St. Petersburg and perhaps Moscow, but I think St. Petersburg was the hub of uh, the Russian government at that point. I could be wrong. But anyway, he was in, in Russia and he writes back about this, this clear brandy that the Russians are fond of drinking, very powerful. And of course it was vodka, you know, that he was writing about and they would serve it hot in the winter in, uh, in uh, Russia. And he talks about how powerful this white clear brandy was and uh, you know, what it was, this vodka. Uh, the, the most prominent one is of course, Jefferson in France, Jefferson, as ambassador to France, he arrives there and Franklin was there before him and Franklin starts telling him about wine and, and, and Jefferson becomes the, uh, the, the father of American wine. And he, he not only likes to drink wine, but he sort of takes on the uh, qualities of the European aristocrat when he does it. He doesn't drink it to get drunk. He uses it to philosophy and talk about science and politics and, uh, and all sorts of things. And, and Jefferson was actually the, the enemy of whiskey. He, he thought that uh, the United States should lower the tariffs on wine. Of course, that would have been very self-serving to him because he spent enormous sums on importing 
French wines, Italian wines, and uh, tax whiskey. He said whiskey is the bane of the people. He thought whiskey was really bad for Americans and that it would uh, result in drunkenness. And he wanted Americans to drink like uh, aristocratic Europeans and have wine and maybe get a little tipsy, but not, not knock down, fall down drunk. And I have to laugh because uh, speaking of Whiskey Wednesday, I like this Thomas Jefferson, this Jefferson whiskey. It's a small batch. He noticed it's empty, but and they have Jefferson's picture on the back, but it's really clever marketing. But but as I said, it, Jefferson was notoriously anti whiskey. But uh, nonetheless, this this Jefferson's uh, whiskey. I, I'm not paid by them, by the way, but uh, is pretty tasty. So it, yeah, and he came back and he really uh, and Madison and Monroe also followed uh, sort of a Jefferson steps. They were sort of against whiskey. Uh, and wanted us to drink wine. But once Jackson got in there, that was all done, you know, because Jackson was a whiskey guy, a, a frontiersman. He wasn't going to drink this white wine from France. Yeah, because, you know, we like liquor and that's what we're going to have. So do you, <laughs> do you think, like, the president kind of mimics the citizen whenever he's in office and drinking or versa vice? Like, I guess my question is, do, you, do, do people kind of look at the, at the president and say, oh, well, he's drinking a lot of whiskey, so we're gonna drink whiskey and now whiskey sales go up and everybody's drinking whiskey. The president doesn't like to drink, so now we're gonna go into prohibition. Do you think that's kind of like, um, do you think that has a lot of impact on how people drink? I guess I should. Yeah, you know what? I, I think it's probably a, they both influence each other in a way, I think. Um, but I think maybe at the elite levels more, and I, I'm thinking of like Jackie Kennedy loved, you know, expensive French champagne. So certainly I think a certain uh, suburban or sophisticated woman from the 60s might want to mimic what Jackie Kennedy was doing and what cocktails that Jackie Kennedy might drink, that kind of thing. You know, um, JFK, would have, who was not a big drinker, but occasionally would, would have a, a doer scotch or something, uh, you know, maybe some people thought, yeah, that's cool. And, and Ike would, uh, Eisenhower would occasionally have a scotch, you know, so maybe scotch comes more into, to, uh, the, the psyche and the thinking of uh, the average guy during that time where, you know, back before 1900, you didn't really hear about scotch in the, in the U.S. It was, you know, rye or bourbon. And scotch really sort of gets a foothold in the uh, White House after uh, and, uh, Andrew Carnegie, the, you know, was one of the richest men in the world, was of Scottish. He'd been born in Scotland and had an affinity for scotch. So, when McKinley becomes president, um, Carnegie sends him a big barrel of uh, scotch whiskey from Scotland uh, saying, hey, I hope this uh, helps you deal with Congress or something to that effect in the coming year. And so, and he would do that with other presidents. All of a sudden this, this big barrel of, of Scottish whiskey would arrive. Um, and uh, that's how scotch sort of got a toehold in there. Did, did that sort of get people to think more about scotch maybe in the uh, 20th century? Maybe, yeah, you know, but it, these guys wouldn't really advertise per se. Uh, although Woodrow Wilson's campaign song was actually, uh, slogan was stolen from a whiskey of the day. There was something called Wilson's Whiskey, which I'd never heard of. And because his last name was Wilson, they, they basically preempted his that, that ad slogan as his political slogan. And um, Wilson Whiskey's uh, ad line was, Wilson, that's all. In other words, this is the only whiskey you should drink. And so Woodrow Wilson, when he ran, his campaign slogan was, Wilson, that's all. And there's a really cool song. You guys should Google it afterwards. Uh, Google Wilson's That's All, and you'll hear his campaign song. And it's really funny. It's like one of these jaunty sort of 
songs that you would think of from that era you know it's pre roaring 20s but it sounds like something from the 20s and it's like you know if you're on the car meaning the street car or at the bar it's wilson wilson that's all it's very jaunty you guys will like it you should play it <laughs> so i had a question we've talked a lot about everyone else all these presidents yada 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 they're cool they're cool but you're the guy that knows all this stuff so you're pretty cool yourself. So what do you drink? What is what, what, when you're sitting at home and you get a chance to like have a, like, are you a whiskey? Are you a rye guy? Do you like go tequila? Are you like doing like car bombs? Like what's, what's, what's your jam? Well, in all honesty, I'm typically more of a beer and wine guy, you know, wine with dinner. I wouldn't sit around normally and like drink wine just to drink. Uh, but I like, you know, I want a really great red wine with a steak or lamb chops or something. Uh, if I'm playing poker, I like beer. Uh, but I'd have to say in the last, and I, I fought the book a little bit for this because once that book came out, I was invited to all these sort of uh, talks and a lot of times there'd be alcohol there. They'd make the McKinley's still light. So yeah, I mean, I like, uh, I like scotch and I like bourbon. I like rye, but I don't drink tons of it. They're kind of like winter drinks for me. You know, uh, recently I, I, I like mezcal for some reason, like, you know, tequila is okay, but mezcal has a certain spiciness to it. And I don't necessarily like it straight, but in a great cocktail, you know, in fact, I had a great cocktail in DC and I forget where it was, one of the, the uh, pretty uh, big time hotels in Georgetown. And somebody told me they had the best Manhattans in the city. So I went there and then I saw this other great stuff on the drink menu. And I thought, you know, I can get a Manhattan almost anywhere. Or maybe I had a Manhattan and then had this after, but I got this Mezcal drink. It was called uh, Winter is Coming. And it was right, of course, during the, uh, the Game of Thrones was ascending and everybody was watching Game of Thrones. And I thought, man, I got to try this. And it had mezcal in it. It was fantastic. And I got, I wormed the ingredients out of the uh, bartender, but I couldn't quite duplicate it at home, you know, because, you know, as you guys probably know, a great bartender is, is skilled at the highest levels. You know, anybody can sit there and make an okay cocktail, but to make a great cocktail where you go, damn, I can't duplicate that. Um, and this north of the wall or, it was either called North of the Wall or Winter is Coming, but it was damn good. I, you know, and powerful. It, it likely sounds like you were at Bur Bourbon Steak in the Four Seasons if you were at a hotel bar that was doing yeah, that in Georgetown. Sure. It was some hotel. And yeah. if you need any help making drinks, there was I mean, you got the three of us on here. And I mean, <laughs> like, we can all help you whip up a mean cocktail, especially Mary. <laughs> yeah, I bet. I would love to hang out with you guys at, uh, you know, uh, the uh, drinks at a cocktail thing. Yeah, sometime. yeah. When we can get back, we're we're looking Tail forward to tales. Or next time you're in DC for sure. Um, so we're yeah. coming up on the holidays. Um, holidays well, gonna, maybe hey, look a little bit different this year for all of us. What are you looking forward to? Drink? Are we talking drink wise? Well, drinks or anything really. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, just off the cuff, Mary, I'm looking forward to seeing my daughter who lives in LA uh, most of the year. And I, I rarely get to see her, but she's coming in with her fiance. And I actually like the fiance. So uh, at least right now. So I'm looking forward to that. Now, drinks wise, when you say Christmas, like I, I would never like drink eggnog other than at a holiday, but a, a really good eggnog. And again, this makes me think of the Civil War book because when I you read these diaries of these soldiers on both sides and it, and you get to December in their diaries and uh, whether they're Billy Yank or Johnny Reb, inevitably they say, you know, we're, we're trying to get some eggs and find some whiskey uh, so we can make an eggnog so it'll be something like home. And, uh, you know, there's something, you know, I, I probably have eggnog like two or three times a year tops but a really well-made eggnog at the holidays um you know something different maybe a little rum in there i don't know uh 
I, I think uh, it's more about nostalgia and feeling at home than the actual uh, drink. Right on. So well, that's as, me. But yeah. <laughs> so as we're talking about the holidays and and your favorites, um, what's your favorite pizza toppings? Or what's your favorite pie in general? Well. This, this sounds really disgusting, man, but there's something uh, uh, that you occasionally see up here in Pennsylvania called pierogi pizza. I don't know if you know what a pierogi is, but it's uh, pierogi normally is like a, a, a pasta shell with uh, mashed potatoes mm -hmm. and onions and pie or cabbage. But they'll put mash, uh, mashed potatoes and onions on top of a pizza. And it sounds disgusting, but it's really I'm good. Down. So I like I like the pierogi pizza. I'm down. Yeah, I'm you should try it. Let's try it. Yeah. And uh, you know, a couple of cold beers. Ben, ben, oh, I see. Are you drinking a Tremens right now? I am uh, drinking some Knob Creek, and here I'm drinking a uh, Deschutes beer from uh, Portland, Oregon, which is really good. Oh, nice. I thought that was the Tremens uh, elephant for a second. Well, this actually is a is a pig. My daughter got this. I see that. That's cool. France, and it's a rince cochon. Cochon being the French word for pig, and he's you know it's a it's a hearty looking pig down in a brew, and uh, my my daughter was an exchange student in northern France, close to the Belgian border, so it's more of a beer area than wine. Right and uh, it's influenced greatly by the way that Belgians Belgians love to make beer. I don't I don't necessarily like a lot of those uh, white beers, but um, you know there's some interesting stuff they put together. So I, I have a I have a one part real question. Well, I mean they're, they're, they're none of them. They're all real, I guess, in space, right? So the first question is: Do you believe a hot dog is a sandwich? And then the second question is. What per, what booze traditions do you wish would come back? Wow. I can think of more booze traditions that I'd like to see scrapped. But uh, no, I do believe a hot dog is a sandwich because you got bread and, you know, you know, I, if peanut butter and jelly is a sandwich, then certainly a hot dog is, especially once you start adding you know, sauerkraut or whatever you like, you know, pickles, onions, whatever, relish to a hot dog. A hot dog, yeah, I mean, other than pizza and beer, you, you think hot dogs and beer. So yeah, I think hot dogs qualify as a sandwich for sure. Um, drinking traditions that I'd like to see come back. I, I'll tell you what, I'd like to see like more actual uh, cool toasts, you know, like, uh, you know, real thought out toasts that, you know, like the Irish saying, you know, may you be in heaven one hour before the devil knows you're dead, that kind of thing, you know, and uh, so a little more ceremony uh, around the drinking process before we all sit down and just, you know, get taken, taken away. <laughs> do, you, do you have any Not good toasts? Uh, I like that Irish one I just, get, just gave. Um, uh, you know, may you be in heaven one hour before the devil knows you're dead. That's a good one on uh, St. Patrick's Day, I believe. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I do know some good toasts, but I, I might have to get back to you on that. But uh, there's some, some good ones that I know in German that it's just not going to happen right here. <laughs> So in addition to being an author of, of things booze and that, you were um, you worked at Runner's World for quite a while, and you've uh, you've um, authored a few running books as well. Um, I, I guess my question is, uh, do those worlds intersect? Like, um, were you a runner, and if you were, how did you recover from whiskey drinking the night before? If you were, if you did, um, and what's what can we can we expect anything new coming out from you at all? Well, I have some ideas. Uh, I, some of the ideas I have are more fiction than nonfiction, but uh, right now they're just in here yet, which may or may not bode well for their their actual uh, hatching. But uh, well, to get back to running, you know, when I was a serious runner, we didn't 
we would never like drink whiskey the night before a marathon or something silly, but we'd, we'd have a few beers. And then afterwards, man, you know, you run 26 miles in Boston, you tend to go to all the bars in Boston or, uh, you know, the, one of your crew is from San Francisco. You run Beta Breakers. You're going to have a few drinks after Beta Breakers, you know, that kind of thing. So at least the guys I ran with, and we were pretty serious runners. I mean, one of my training partners made the Olympic trials three or four times. I mean, we were running 90, 100 miles a week. But one of the reasons we liked it is you could eat as much pizza and drink as much beer as you wanted and, uh, and still – you know, stay relatively fit. So runners are big beer drinkers. And, and back in the seventies and eighties, when the first running boom hit, and that's when I was in my twenties and thirties and stuff, uh, you almost always had kegs at the end of a race, but it was more beer and runners couldn't afford wine, you know, or not good wine anyway. So, but you know, we, we would often, for instance, run uh, the Falmouth road race up in Cape Cod. And that, that race, which is one of the biggest races in the world uh, and draws Olympians to run it, started from a bar uh, in one town and finished at a bar in Falmouth Heights. So it, st it started at Captain Kidd's bar in Falmouth and finished at another bar. And needless to say, there was you know a lot of drinking going on at the post-race party. Um, it, you ran Boston and New York marathon a lot of times guys would be trying to hand you drinks you know which is crazy you know so you're in the middle of the race and some guy in boston at you know 19 miles goes hey you want a beer and it's you know nah i think i'll wait till later thanks so uh you know i think it's always kind of been there uh you know i don't know anymore because uh, you know i i don't think i used to race uh i've been running for over 50 years so, uh, but some of the races were really, really cool. And there's even races, of course, where you can, you have to drink a beer a mile or something. There's a, there's a, a race in France, it's a marathon and, and you, uh, you drink a, a little thing of champagne. I don't think it's every mile, but every five miles or something at the rest stop instead of water, you can get champagne and a lot of people do. And uh, of course you'd be trashed at the end because when you're working out, alcohol is just blowing through your bloodstream so yeah um yeah it gets to you pretty quick yeah you run a race in new orleans are you kidding me and you afterwards but yeah it's another race i ran at this 10k crescent city 10k yeah. and it finished in audubon park and we had uh you know bluegrass bands playing and and all the dixie beer you could drink you know so it was always part of the culture, a fun part, I thought. Go run a whole bunch to get drunk afterwards. That sounds like a win. <laughs> yeah, for real. Yeah, yeah. Well, you can justify it, man. If you, if you run 26 miles, you deserve a drink or two. Yeah, 12. No one's just You should have a beer for every mile you ran, as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's why you run. Stay thin, man. <laughs> I mean, if it's raining, we run from bar yeah. to bar anyway. Yeah, right. True. <laughs> Very true. Very true. Very true. So we're actually getting close uh our, our one hour. So I want to go around a horn and, and see if anyone wants to say anything as before we get out of here. So Mary, I'll start with you. I just want to say thank you to Mark for joining us. This was a super fun show. Um, I, I missed the cookie run. Um, I wish, you know, maybe dad will package us up some cookies and send them to us in the mail, but we'll see. Um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I really appreciate you uh, thinking of me, Mary, and putting it together and, and talking to you and your crew has been awesome. Chris, you got anything, daddy? Man, you know what? Everybody out there, just stay safe. Put on a mask, wash your hands. Stay safe. Stay safe. <laughs> and I love you all. <laughs> Mark, you got anything on the way out? <laughs> well, I, I really um, I really enjoyed just talking with you guys. It was cool. 
Thank you. Very Thank relaxed. You for joining yeah. us. Yeah. Guys are my people. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Mary, uh, I, I think you you definitely hit a home run with with bringing Mark on as a guest. This has been I, I, one of my favorite episodes. Such such information and and just I'm gonna like use all these all this knowledge when I go to a bar 